recording. Okay, got it. And hello. Hello to Steve, Stephen Fraser. Hello it's there. So it's so great to have you on the show. Thank you um, so much. I, I love your bow tie. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I have the wonderful opportunity here of spending uh, some time with a man who I adore in this industry, Steve Stephen Fraser, not not Fraser, um, <laughs> who is a um, what? Are, what are you? You're you're a senior senior editor. I'm an executive literary agent. A executive literary agent at Jennifer <laughs> De Chiara. Yes. Uh, I will get this right. You know, you have to ask yourself, Steve, what am I doing here, right? Why did they pick me? I never get anything right. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm uh, I'm very happy to have you. So um, I am Mel Rosenberg, and I'm the host of the Children's Literature Channel of the New Books Network. Sometimes they get that wrong, too. <laughs> and um, it's great to have you. And we're going to talk about um, the joy of children's writing and a lot of other things. So uh, before we start, um, I'm going to tell you why everybody loves you. Uh, okay. How many how many submissions, how many queries do you get a day? Oh, I probably get about 50 queries. I turn on my computer at 7 a.m. and it's on to about 11 p.m. I get about 50 queries, and usually from people I don't know, all day, every single day, all day long. Okay, here's the thing. And I'm speaking from experience. Um, as someone who's queried you, 90% um, of the time, you answer me with advice, with thoughts, with generosity. And the one time that you didn't answer me, and I told you in New York, and you said, oh, that couldn't be. I have to check. <laughs> yeah, I do try to answer everybody. I mean, I do get ahead of myself sometimes, and I have to go back and look at and, But, you know, I always tell people, if I haven't gone back to you, it's just because I've gotten swamped. Just try me again and I because I answer everybody. Um, okay. So you answer 50 people a day. 50 people a day. I used to be a scientist. Is a um, let's see, 1,500 people a month, more or less? Oh my goodness. Yes, yes. I'm gonna give you a discount, Steve. Let's say it's only a thousand a month. Okay. It's still twelve thousand queries a year. Yes. And well, you I'm, answer, you answer almost all of them. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, you have to remember is that's only part of what I do. I mostly am in touch with my clients and the editors that I connect them with. So I do love getting queries from people and finding out about new projects, but that's a very small percentage of actually what my main job is, which is to sell books for writers um, that I represent. Yes, and I, I'm getting there. Absolutely. So, <laughs> so of the 10,000, and, and you represent about 40 leading authors in children's yes. literature. Yes. Yeah, I do. And, I, I, I have about 40 clients. You know, I would never say, if I meet someone that I think is talented, I would never say no, but I'm not honestly looking for new clients at this point. Um, and I want every client to feel like they're my number one client, you know, at the time that I'm face to face with them. So I always have to ask myself, can I really, number one, do something for the new client and do I have time to really take proper care of them? Um, you know, when you're first starting off, you're looking for business, but I've been around long enough that I have that already, but I'm always, I am always looking for talent. Okay, but 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 you're 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 full up. You have a full house of talented uh, authors. Yes, yes, okay. and you know it is a business, so people come and go for whatever reason. Um, people retire, or um, so yeah. But but essentially, I've got about forty or so people. Yeah. So in a given year, in a given year, uh, you might of, of the forty people, you might take on how many new authors? Uh, maybe two or three every year. Okay, so that means that. Um, you are choosing one author from about 5,000 queries that you get? Yes. And people have to it's, know it's the odds. Lot. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot. But um, I mean, I kind of feel as though even if I don't decide to work with someone, I can usually help them in some small way by 
sharing something positive or yes. Well, what, what everybody wants to know, Steve, is why you do that. Agents close, agents open one week a year, agents send you these terrible form responses, you know, dear occupants. And you take the time, despite your busy schedule, to write to everybody, including me, giving well, me good ideas. You know, I just kind of feel like, how would I want to be treated? Um, I would want someone to be polite. I would like someone to maybe say something constructive. Um, I don't know. I, I just try to see it from their point of view. Um, and, you know, I, I think that... I don't think it does anyone any good to be rude or to be dismissive. Um, I mean, for instance, there's some editors who literally do not respond. If you send them a manuscript, I, I kind of feel as an agent, they should at least say, thank you. You know, I'm not looking for anything or this isn't what I'm looking for. But there's some people who literally do not respond. And I think that's really bad form. I think that there's a kind of good sportsmanship that's part of publishing or should be. So I tried to be honorable in that way and respond. I really, I feel that's important. Okay. And that's what makes you in the, in a Jewish phrase, a mensch. Uh, okay. Um, well, and and that, that's why, that's why you are held in such high regard. Uh, well, because... that's kind of, I, mean, I, I mean, I'm hoping that my colleagues have a similar approach. I mean, the trust me, trust me, most of them don't they uh, should they might but they don't and you do so yeah. um I, you're a little reticent talking about your upbringing but what made you such a good person caring yeah. about your fellow man <laughs> well I, I don't know i mean i don't want to um talk too much about myself i grew up in boston which is kind of a, a literary environment i mean we would go into the city go to theater, go to the Museum of Fine Arts. So, and my family is, I think, a cultured family. Um, my dad and I um, would, my dad took me um, to move, we'd go to movies and I would talk about them afterwards. We'd go to plays. Um, uh, there were always books around. And I mean, I, I was an English major in college. I did a lot of theater. I studied voice and I danced. So I did a lot of musical theater. Um, I'm, and then I did a master's degree in children's literature. So I've kind of always kind of been heading towards literature and books. And so in a nutshell, that's my training. Okay. Before I take you away from your childhood, um, <laughs> we're, we're going to talk mostly about, about picture books today because okay. that's, the, that's the only genre that I know a little bit about. Okay. Um, if it's okay with you, I know that you're a... Uh, sure. Your sweet spot is middle grade, but you're also a picture book lover. Oh, absolutely, yes. I mean, there's so, nothing I love more than a picture book manuscript. It's it's deceivingly difficult to do. It's interesting, during COVID, a lot of people thought, oh, I'm gonna write a children's book. It's how hard could that be? Well, it's very difficult. It's kind of like writing a poem. Every word matters. And I'm quite fussy with picture book manuscripts. I mean, as a former, I was an editor for 25 years before I became an agent. And so my approach to agenting has an editorial bent. But with picture books, I'm pretty fussy. And I won't let something go out until I feel every word is right. Um, you know, it, it's, it sounds silly, but a single word can actually make a difference in a manuscript um, or, a, or a sentence. Um, so yeah, picture books are, are it, it takes a great deal of skill. And, and the challenge of writing a picture book is that you have to leave space for the art. Marie okay, said- well, wait, let's, let's, let's get back to, to that in okay. a moment. Okay. Okay. So what we're segueing away from, I want to segue back to when you were a five-year-old. Oh, what okay. The big picture books were there in your home. What did you grow up on? You know, I kind of feel like I had a British upbringing because I loved <laughs> Beatrix Potter, you know, Peter Rabbit and um, The Tailor of Gloucester, all those books. I mean, I loved, um, in terms of stories, um, Peter Pan was my favorite book growing up. Um, 
but we were, I was read aloud. I mean, picture books, interesting. I can't really think of, I think it wasn't until I was a little bit older, picture books. Um, but I remember stories when I was a child, you know, um, Peter Pan, um, um, you know, all the Beatrix Potter stories, Sacred Garden, all the kind of classic children's books. Um, picture books, for, in, for some reason, my memory are a little bit later. Um, mm -hmm. And 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 you 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 mentioned something that I agree with that uh, writers write to their child. Yes, yes, I think so. so. I, I mean, I think that writers tend to like picture book writers. There's like a eight year old or six year old inside them. If you write middle grade, it's a ten year old. If you write YA, you're a thirteen year old. But I do think as writers, you tend to have a certain age the voice of a certain age within you so so i'm a writer i'm a five-year-old writer i i know this and and i know why yeah. uh, but <laughs> i'm interviewing you today so <laughs> as as an editor at harper collins and uh, an agent for for many years uh you are an agent at what age what age is the steve that finds what you call the delicious words in a book you know what that's interesting you asked that i would say about 12 um maybe slightly younger I, I think middle grade readers are the strongest readers they're fully formed adults and they have a strong moral sense and they're very loyal to you as a reader when kids become teenagers i think their attention span wanders and if if, if you don't grab your attention right away they're on to the next book or something else but a middle grade reader is pretty loyal. Um, so I read like a middle grade kid, I think. <laughs> I, I just I just gobble up things that I really like um, and I tend to be passionate about them. So yeah, I think I'm about maybe 12. This is very interesting because uh, we, we talked in New York and you said, Mel, you need to write a middle grade. Yes. And I, I came back home and I said, oh, but where is my 10 year old? <laughs> I, I have to be, I have to be reintroduced to him. I'm used to writing with my five year old. Yes. Um, so th this is, this is an issue when you leave your, you know, your sweet spot genre yes. to find your child at another age. Yes. Well, it's not that hard for me, believe me. <laughs> I mean, children love to be entertained. They want to be maybe scared a little bit, or they want to laugh out loud with their friends. They want to be comforted. Um, they want to be delighted with beautiful images. So for me, it's not that hard to go from middle grade to the picture book age. OK, let's go back to picture books now. OK. So so you've talked about the joy, uh, the, the manifest, the joy manifest the, yes. um, the, that's inherent in, in children's publishing. Yes. Uh, but I'm going to take you back now 15 minutes uh, when we talked about the percentage of authors that get deals. Yes. So you write to everybody, but you take one in 5,000. Yes. And um, for, and I think the odds are really one in 1,000 because, you know, um, there's other agents and other possibilities. And yes. Um, so, and, and as I told you, I have a book coming out and I was at the printer yesterday and yeah. um, I, I cried. I, this is like, it is joy manifest. It is, yeah. it is a, a rapturous moment. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, you stick your nose into the big uh, papers. I have them over here. <laughs> and you're in some kind of nirvana. Yes. Uh, but for the past seven years, I've been in hell. Hmm. And 99.9% .9 of children's writers are in hell or purgatory. They, they haven't reached this, uh, this passion, this rapturous moment. And most of them never will. Well, I mean, I think there's joy also in creating. And I think finding the words to translate your feelings and your thoughts into words or pictures, I think is a joyful thing. I mean, uh, yes, getting published is great and should be a goal. Um, but I think that even for many people published many times, 
um, I think it's kind of like being an actor, being in the rehearsal room is a very exciting place because you're creating something. And so as a writer, being at your desk or wherever you write, just writing is a joyful thing. So I think that, yes, the goal is to get published, but I think I wouldn't focus just on that. It's, it's having a great idea and putting it down, shaping it, crafting it, making it perfect. There's a joy in that too. So I think you shouldn't, I think writers shouldn't pressure themselves and say, I haven't gotten published yet, or I haven't gotten my second book published or whatever. You know, that, that all comes, but the joy is in the creation and the sharing of what you have to say with another. Um, uh, when, I, uh, when I left my other pursuits uh, and decided to write full-time more or less, um, I realized that for me, writing is not a profession, it's a calling. Yes, it, it's kind of like the poet Rilke said, if you wake up in the middle of the night and you ask yourself, must I write? And the answer is yes, then you're a writer. It, it, it's a compulsion. If it becomes just a job, I think that's quite a different thing. Um, but yes, I, I think creative people, you just have to write. Okay, this can happen at any age. Because I, I, I was writing flippantly until seven years ago, and then I went to the SCBWI in New York and said, Oy vey, there's a way to do it. Show <laughs> yeah. me, show me. Yes. For, for many writers don't know the way, uh, especially picture book writers, as you mentioned. Um, but, but I want to challenge what you said, and I've been thinking about this for several months since, since we met in New York. Okay. Um, there's a difference between being an actor and writing picture book manuscripts. Um, and, and that is because uh, not everybody goes on Broadway. Were you on Broadway? Uh, no. Okay, were you off Broadway? Off, off Broadway? Off, off, off Broadway? You know, high school, college, community theater. Friends of mine have been on, on Broadway, but yeah. No, by the time I um, probably would have pursued theater, I had already decided literature meant more to me. Okay, but the, the point I'm trying, to, I'm going to try and make the point now. Okay. And the, the point is the following. If you write a middle grade, okay, um, and it's, I don't know, so many tens of thousands of words, and I send it to you, and you ask for the uh, complete submission, yes. then you see the book. Yes. If I'm a picture book author, and the book that I finally managed to, uh, to get published here in Israel um, took me five years to write, mm -hmm. because as you say, picture books are very difficult, and you want every word to be delicious. Right. Yes. Uh, like we don't eat our classmates, so we 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 don't eat our words, but they they still have to be delicious every single one of them. Yes. Uh, but if you're an actor, you can perform in high school. You can perform in college. Yeah. You don't have to go all the way to Broadway. But yeah. if you're writing picture book manuscripts, if they don't get illustrated, then to an extent they don't exist. Well, that's true. Yes, you're right. Yeah, I mean the. A picture book is really a marriage of art and text together. And really what you're doing is creating a launching pad for an illustrator to then create a visual narrative to be wed to your literal uh, narrative. So yes, you're right. But I mean, I think a picture book writer has to have a, a good visual sense. What is it gonna look like? Not are you gonna do the pictures yourself, but how do you see it? You know, is, is it going to be cartoony? Is it going to be painterly? Is it going to be graphic? You know, kind of what is it going to look like? Um, so I do think a picture book writer has to, in their mind, have that, you know, at, at work. Okay, but then, um, so I mean, even people who are published, right? I mean, if I could publish a book a year until I die, I'll still have 40 manuscripts that never get illustrated. Yes. Um, and and um, it, but isn't it so that when you do find an agent and when you do get a publishing deal, the author really gives his baby that he's worked on for years and revised 90 times and is selected out of the 5,000 stories <laughs> that come across Steve Fraser's desk. 
and Steve gets a publishing deal and still you have your dream about the illustrations, but they come out completely different. Well, yes, I mean, that's part of it. I mean, it takes great humility to be able to hand off your manuscript to an illustrator. In fact, yesterday at the book event, I was at this question came up and um, yes, I mean, I would say in at least 75% of books that are published, the author is happily surprised by the way it looks. Sometimes it's totally different. I imagine sometimes it might be disappointing, but I think what you have to do is, number one, it takes great humility to hand off the manuscript to the publisher and say, make of this what you will, but that's part of the process. But then you have to just trust the process. It's all of a piece. It's not you against an illustrator. It's not you against the illustrator and the editor. You're all working together. And I think you just have to trust that it'll all come out in one satisfying, happy, beautiful whole. And it, it, it invariably does. Um, I'm sure there are some cases where it wasn't maybe how you saw it exactly, but I, for, for my clients, I always ask for um, um, consultation rights. So you don't have final say over the art, but you, you do have the right to weigh in with your opinion and say, this illustration doesn't look how I saw the character or this is factually incorrect. So it's the, the author can weigh in with their opinion. But, but the illustrator also has to feel that it's their book as well. Absolutely, yes, yeah. So, and interestingly, probably you will not have any contact with the illustrator. Even if it's someone you know, they need to be, feel free to do their creative work, just like you, have, you were free for months or even years doing your creative work. So, but, it, but that's just part of the process, but it's all of a piece. So you just need to see, it's nothing to be afraid of, or to even to fight, it's all of a piece and it's a harmonious working together. And invariably it's a happy experience. Steve, uh, you accept manuscripts from picture book authors. Yes. Um, okay, we, we've mentioned that you have enough or more than enough, but you're always yes. looking for a delicious text. Yes. Um, and um, what advice do you have then to the authors regarding art notes? Because this is always a matter of controversy. Yes, I would say or no art notes at all. Um, I think you, writers have to trust that their words will be understood. A good editor can read a manuscript and already they have an illustrator in mind. You know, they can visualize a finished book. If they can't, then they're not the right editor. But I mean, having been an editor, I, I can read a picture book manuscript and I, I can already see what it, what it could look like. Um, so I think an editor would, you know, should be able to do that. Um, so I am um, this, this, uh, you know, I, I've got received sage advice from you uh, on about five manuscripts. And one of the most important things that you taught me uh, very generously was um, to think more about the illustrations. And, yeah. and what, it, it wasn't that I haven't been thinking. It's to think even more. Yes, I think. I think if you can write a picture book and you're thinking ahead of what can I, what scenes can I create that an illustrator could then visually portray, that's the thing. I think some people writing picture books write a short story, which actually is quite wrong because a picture book is half art, half text. So you really do need to leave space for pictures. Um, you know, as an editor, when I was working on a picture book, you would edit it twice. You edit a picture book as the text. And then when the art is in place, there's some text that becomes redundant because it's already in the pictures. So you, you have to always think about how does the art and the text, how do they balance together? So um, as an author uh, who has a suffered some angst on this question. Um, you have to overcome this, you know, as an author, you know, you, you want to have as many words as, as you can. You know, you yeah. don't want to be completely overshadowed by the illustrations. Uh, and this is wrong. If, if an editor takes your story and, and um, 
you know, cuts it down to, to 40 words, you're a lucky camper. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, it takes great um, skill to do a picture book because it is understated. And as I said, you're kind of creating a launching pad for an illustrator to then go off on their own and create a visual narrative. Um, in terms of art notes, I would say if, for instance, you've written this picture book and you see it as a story of, about elephants, although there's nothing in the text that lends itself to elephantesque behavior, then I would put that in the art note and say, I see this as a family of elephants. Um, if there's something at the end that's a reveal that you think is best shown in the art and not in the words, again, that should be an art note. But I think otherwise, I wouldn't include art notes because I think that's starting to take over the illustrator's job, which, which is to be very creative and come up with something unexpected and wonderful. So as a rule, I say no art notes unless they're absolutely essential. Um, some people, I think they, they're a bit controlling and they try to generously, I guess, provide notes to an illustrator, but generally an illustrator doesn't want that. They want to go off on their own and create something entirely individual. Absolutely. Uh, that's something that you have to learn, though. Yes, yeah. It, it, it's a letting go mechanism. Absolutely, yes. So the, the next thing, that, the next thing that, that my viewers are going to want to know, Steve, is a query letter or picture book text. Because if you're writing a middle grade, well, the query letter is going to be very important. Yes. Um, but, you know, I'm sending you a query letter. You can just scroll down and in one less than one minute, see whether you like the story or not. Yes, I mean, a query letter is is just a nicety. Um, it just says, here I am, you know, I've been published before or I've not been published. Um, here's the story, um, you know, let me know if you like it. And then yes, you attach the picture book manuscript. You know, queries, whether it's middle grade, YA or picture book, I spend about three seconds. I mean, I don't have a lot of time um, if someone's been published, I like to know just so I know kind of where they are career-wise. If they've not been published, that doesn't bother me at all. Um, but the query letter is like a resume. All it does is get your foot in the door. I don't really spend a lot of time reading it. I really just want to read the picture book manuscript. You know, my training, my very first job in publishing was at Highlights for Children, Children's Magazine. We got 200 manuscripts a week. And every editor read every manuscript. So at the end of my two years working there, I could read a sentence and tell you, this is a writer that I want to work with, or no, I'm not interested. So in terms of queries, after 43 years, I'm pretty good at judging, you know, after a sentence or even a paragraph, I know exactly who the writer is and if I want to pursue working with them. Um, so yeah, a query, I don't spend a lot of time, but it's simply because I've done this so often that I kind of, know, I, I can tell right away. Okay, so uh, we have, you've given great advice to uh, picture book authors already. Is, is there anything that we've missed here that you want to share? Well, you know, something I always tell people is think of a picture book as like a performance piece. You know, a picture book is going to be read by a parent, a grandparent, a teacher, a librarian, or even the child themselves. So the sound of the words is very important. You know, it should be fun to say out loud. Um, the reader shouldn't be caught up in long sentences, um, but it should be fun and it should sound good. Sometimes I tell people, you know, take your picture book manuscript and read it out loud. You can do an ear check, you know, does, does, it, does every word sound right? Do all these words sound good together? Or better still have someone else read your manuscript to you out loud, because that's very important. But think of it as a performance piece. I think that's an important thing, because in a sense, it is going to be performed. So, so in essence, a, a, a picture book writer is a kind of a, a playwright for five-year-olds. Absolutely, yes. yes. Wow. And, and one of the things I found is that I can re I can revise a manuscript umpteen times, give it to somebody to read, and they make mistakes when they're reading it. And then I pencil in these mistakes because these mistakes are actually the way it should read. Uh, well, yes. I mean, 
sometimes that's why it's good to have an object like a writer's group or an agent. You need an objective eye and ear because some, when you've been really working on something, crafting it, there may be very simple things you actually don't see or hear because it's so it's in your head. Um, so yeah, I think that's an important lesson. Um, are there any other lessons? Because now we're going to segue to the ear. Okay. Um, I don't know. I, I think that's it. I mean, I think we, we, we um, haven't talked about enough about joy. Okay. And I'll tell you, and maybe I'll tell you why. Um, because I've been thinking about this. I'm going to interview Steve Fraser and I'm going to challenge him. What's this joy? You know, you work and you revise a manuscript 90 <laughs> times and you get rejected and rejected and rejected and you never know when you're going to accept it. Where's the joy here? And then I get a manuscript accepted and it becomes a book. <laughs> and I, I'm joyous. Yes. So, well, I mean, the joy partly, like I said before, is in the creation. It's kind of, you know, when you're putting together words, finding the right words to say what you want to say, what you're feeling, there's a joy in that. Um, and it's not just the joy of the finished book that people are gonna buy many copies of and make mm -hmm. you a wealthy person. There's, a, there's an inner joy <clears throat> that you start with. I mean, every morning waking up in finding just the joy of being, I think that it starts there. And then the joy is in the work of working with words and crafting the words to say what you really want to say. Then there's the joy in sharing it with someone else let someone else hear your story and enjoy what you've what you've done and then there's the joy of maybe it'll get published and you'll share it with thousands of people um so joy but joy starts within with you just you know every day it bubbles up it's and it doesn't need it doesn't need a compliment it doesn't need a publishing deal it just bubbles up within because that's what life is all about and I, I couldn't agree with you more. The, 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 the days that I have a story to tell are very happy days for me. Yes. And, 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 and you know, if you go on the internet, people are saying, write for the market, write for the market. And you're saying, don't write for the market. Write what makes you happy inside. Yes, I think that's right. I mean, I think if you're writing for the market, writing to trend, as they say, you know, well, I'll tell you a story. This trends change every day. When I worked at HarperCollins, I, now I swear you this is true. I went into an editorial meeting. The publisher said, you know, princesses are a big deal these days. Everything has got to have a princess in it. Princess in the title, princess in the story. So <laughs> everyone started looking for books about princesses. Um, picture books, novels, everything. I swear to you, the next meeting, the next month, princesses were out. It was something else. So if you had acquired a book about a princess, already it was considered passe at the publisher. So, I mean, that's an extreme example, but I think that if you're writing to trend, um, by the time the book is published, which is probably a year, maybe two years later, that trend is already gone. So, but I think what, I, I think writers, when you're in touch with your creative self, writers tend to be prescient. And so they write about something and two years later, it's the it thing. And you didn't know that, but your creative spirit, whatever, knew that. So I think you just trust the inspiration that you have and that'll bring you to the right place. But yes, trying to write to the market, writing to trend, that's always a disaster because it's changing every day. So the trick is to write to your inner child, yeah. to write with your passion. And, yeah. and 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 to be happy about it. Uh, yeah. When I'm when I'm giggling while I write, that's the possibility that it might be a good a good manuscript. Yes. Now, when our my the owner of our agency, we it started off with just the two of us. We shared an office, and I I would be reading our picture book manuscript, and I would fall on the floor laughing. I mean, we were just terrible together <laughs> because we encouraged each other, but. Yes, when you can just have delight in something, enjoy something, that's a good sign for your writing. Okay, and that's a, um, so I, you know, I, I, I like the story. I, I came to argue with you and I find myself now agreeing. 
<laughs> well, that's right, good. right from joy. Um, yeah. And I mean, enjoy. I mean, you could write, I mean, one of my clients wrote a picture book about grief. And so you wrote, she wrote from grief, but she wrote from her own feelings. And it, it's a beautiful book. It took her about five years to kind of that mm -hmm. idea to germinate became a beautiful, beautiful picture book. Um, but, but it was a joyful thing for her to be able to translate those feelings into words and then to share it with readers. Um, so even darkish things in our life, it, it, there is a joy to be able to share, to um, put it down in words and then to share it. Yes, and many of these words, you know, it's very, um, it's very ambivalent because passion, passion comes from pain. Um, so, so joy also comes from angst. You can't have one without the other. Right. Um, so I really appreciate this discussion. And um, as, as you know, in my previous, when I, before I joined the New Books Network, um, every week I would uh, force, cajole the interviewee to sing a song, usually a Beatles uh -huh. song. But um, I discovered in New York that you're actually a singer. Well, yeah, kind of. Um, so even though it's now the New Books Network, um, let's talk for a moment about your love of theater and then ask you to sing a song for us. Uh, um, yes, I always loved theater. When I was really little, I loved puppets. I had a, a, a beautiful puppet theater. Um, and then um, I, I studied piano. And then my piano teacher actually was a singing teacher also. And I realized that I liked singing. So actually I paid my way through college singing, I sang, singing in church and singing at weddings. Um, but I did a lot of musical theater and I dance also. Um, I did some dance classes in college. Um, but so I, I started Snoopy and Your Good Man, Charlie Brown. I starred in um, Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp as Aladdin. Wow. Um, I starred in Half a Sixpence. I know that Tommy Steele show um, with a Cockney accent. Um, I did Kiss Me Kate, Brigadoon, um, Man of La Mancha. I played the Padre. Um, uh, yeah, so I've done a lot of theater, but it's but it's something that I that I really love. Um, but I, as I said, I kind of got to a place where I realized that I love literature more. And I, I kind of feel like in theater, there's a lot of thinking about yourself, you know, do people like me? Do they like the sound of my voice? Do, do, do I look good? And I found that I didn't want to spend that much time thinking about myself. I really wanted to um, deal with uh, books and help people create their books, first as an editor and then as an agent. So that, it's, that's a more comfortable spot for me. But I've, but I've always loved theater and my favorite present growing up was being taken to go see a show, you know, um, by my parents, so. What are your favorite shows from, from when you were a kid? Um, well, my childhood was essentially um, listening to the cast albums of My Fair Lady, Camelot, South Pacific. Now, here's a funny story. When I was in second grade, we went, I, we, I, we moved and I went to a new school. I stood up in front of my class and performed Dix in French from South Pacific. I thought everybody loved musical comedy. I it didn't dawn on me that I was odd. <laughs> and everyone just sat there wondering what was going on. For me, it was a very joyful moment. I loved it. And uh, pourquoi pas? And you also speak French. Un petit peu, oui. Yeah, no, c'est pas bien. Um, <laughs> le français. Um, and, and so, um, and I know that you love Sondheim. Yes. Uh, but, but you were not willing to, um, to um, reveal to me which song you were going to sing for our audience. Well. <laughs> Now's the time, Steve. Okay, well, I've been thinking about this a little bit. And there's a song that I really like. Should I just go ahead and do it? Well, you can either say what it is or not. I, you know, it's your, it's okay. your, it's your interview. Okay. Well, when I was about twelve, my parents took me to see Sweet Charity in Boston, the touring company starring Cheetah Rivera. And there's a song that I love from that called "I'm a Brass Band." Do you know that song? 
Um, I probably do, but uh, that's the one you're going to sing, right? Well, Charity is kind of down in her luck. And suddenly she meets someone. And so she sings the song. And as she sings the song, a brass band comes out on stage and she sings with the brass band. It's so cute. So I thought I would sing this little portion of that. Absolutely. I'm a brass band, I'm an orchestra, I'm a clarinet. I'm the Philadelphia Orchestra, I'm the mo modern jazz quartet. I'm Yasha Heifetz, also Horowitz, a wild count bassy blast. I'm the bells of St. Peter's in Rome. I'm tissue paper on a comb and all kinds of music is pouring out of me cause somebody loves me at last. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm here all week. Thousands of people are now applauding from all over the world. <laughs> or turning yeah. off the channel. No, I don't think so. That was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. And you, you gave all that up for a literary career. Uh, do you want to know something interesting? My biggest idol my whole life was Julie Andrews. When I worked at HarperCollins, I was in charge of Harper Trophy, the paperback program. One of my authors was Julie Andrews. So when she would come into the office, I'd be standing there with a rose to give her. Not just the first time, but literally every single time she came into the office. But that was like a dream come true for me. Yeah, I was just going to say your dream came true in an unexpected and unanticipated And she's manner. exactly what you hoped she would be. She was lovely, lovely to look at, lovely in manner. She would say, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> That's so wonderful. Yeah, so that was a great moment. That's incredible. Um, so... The last thing that I want to mention is that uh, you, you've said in the previous interview, I, I did listen to them several times, uh, that you were a little unhappy at HarperCollins because um, they took away your joy. You had to meet um, deadlines. You had to meet certain expectations of making money. Yeah. And you were, you were much happier when you became an agent. Yeah. And you discovered the joy of writing. You know, I, I loved being at HarperCollins and... I mean, being at a big publisher, um, you can do things you couldn't do anywhere else. Like I just, I published a young adult author who had never been published before. And um, I wouldn't have been able probably to do that at a smaller house because they, you can't take a risk um, like that. Um, it, you know, there it was a lot of reasons that I left HarperCollins and I won't go into it online. I'll tell you. But are, are you, okay. But are you happier as an agent? Yes. So. Um, I was walking to work one day and I was thinking, you know, this isn't fun anymore. Um, I'm working in children's books and it wasn't fun. You know, I was executive editor. I had to bring in $2 million worth of revenue. You know, you have to kind of choose product, pro, um, projects that are going to bring in a certain amount of money. So it's not just about editorial integrity. It's also about what's going to make money. That's a lot, that's a burden for an editor to have that kind of, I mean, certainly it's a business, you have to make money, but yeah. So when um, my friend Jennifer said, you know, I started my own agency, but I'm thinking of growing it. Would you like to join me? I would never thought of that. Um, so um, having been an editor for 25 years, I kind of knew all the editors, I knew the houses, so I kind of had that work that an agent would have to do to figure out the business I had already done. So it was kind of a natural step for me. So, and, you know, it sounds really hokey, but I, every day I do think, you know, I'm helping getting books into the hands of children. And that's a wonderful thing. Um, I do think about it every day. Yeah, but Steve, I, I think that that's one of the highest callings of a, of a, so per of a, of a person. Uh, because um, the children's books that I grew up on are for life. Yes, absolutely. And, and you know, so we aspire in our different ways um, to have that effect on children, that, that there's one child somewhere in the world 
that is going to hug my book and remember him, remember the book when, when he's my age. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's, it's a kind of responsibility, too. I mean, it's kind of a sobering thought. Um, the words we choose are going to influence a child's life and, and their future. And, um, but I do take it seriously. And I, I hope other people, you know, publishing and do as well. But we do have to think seriously about children and what we're giving them. Dave, I think that you're one of a kind. Um, I don't want you to stop uh, giving your generous answers to everyone who queries you. Uh, <laughs> but, but trust me, you are unique in this. Um, and it's been great. And um, I'm saving my question for last. Okay. Um, you want to guess what it is? Uh, <laughs> I don't okay, do I'll, I'll give you a hint. I'll give you a hint. Okay. Okay. Um, and I, I've posed this question to, to several editors and agents. Um, you love children's books. Yes. Uh, you live children's books. You breathe children's books. Uh, and you've um, developed this thesis that writing for children and publishing for children, I can even quote you if I find it here, um, is um, you said that joy should drive the publishing industry. You say joy is the soil of children's books. Right. The main thing for you is joy. Yes. So what am I going to ask you, Steve? <laughs> I don't know. Why don't you write children's books? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. Um, I do have some books in me. Um, I've written some. Um, I've written some things which I've had printed privately and shared, like with family members and friends, maybe for Christmas presents. Um, um, so I have written. Um, I don't know. I mean, I do think I have some books in me, but I kind of feel. I think it, it, I'm more important as a supporter of someone who is a writer than to focus on myself. Um, I mean, some people are, are, are truly born writers and they need to really be cherished. Um, so I, I kind of feel like my job is to help nourish the talent. Um, I think that's my primary talent. I, I may write something or two <laughs> sometime, but that's not really my focus. If, if you do, I know a really great agent you can submit to. <laughs> okay, well, you have to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Off camera. Okay. And so th this has been a wonderful conversation. Yes, thank uh, with, you so much. No, it's a, it's a huge honor and privilege for me. Um, I uh, I met you in New York. It was a great uh, 20 minutes. I know how busy you are. And um, I said to my wife, you know, I, I had coffee. I had coffee was, I didn't have coffee. You had tea uh, with Steve Fraser. And it was worth coming to New York um, to just to meet you. Uh, you are you are an icon in this in this industry, um, and uh, it's been wonderful talking to you. And uh, I've been with Steve Fraser. Now let me get it right this time. You are the executive senior agent, executive senior senior agent executive. No manifest. It's, <laughs> no, it's executive literary agent. Okay. At the okay now I, I'm going to get everything wrong now. Um, at the Jennifer De Chiara agency. Yes. Yes, that's right. We've been around for 22 years. I've been, so I've been there 18, going on 19 years. Um, and uh, it's been wonderful spending some time with you uh, in uh, New York and Tel Aviv here, as we did today, the marvels of modern technology. And, um, and this is the Children's Literature Channel of the New Books Network. And I'm Mel Rosenberg saying thank you to all of our listeners and viewers. And if you have any questions for Steve Fraser, um, I'm sure he'll answer them. <laughs> and if you have if you have picture book manuscripts that you've worked on hard and long and that um, have delicious words, <laughs> you never know, right? Send them along. Absolutely. Thanks, Mel. Steve, it's been great. Thanks so much. Thank you.